Welcome to the third plenary session. Good morning to all of you on video and those of you here in the auditorium. After this plenary, we have another full day of symposia and workshops. And then this evening, we celebrate our progress over the last year. We hope to see many of you on the dance floor. Before we get to this morning's presentation, there are some important awards and people to thank for their important contributions to this conference. First, the CF Care Centers. They're at the heart of our efforts to help people with CF stay healthy so that they can lead full productive lives. As you know, care centers are where people with CF and their families come together with multidisciplinary care teams to deal with the day-to-day -day challenges of this disease. Where deep relationships are formed that help sustain people with CF and enrich the lives of the healthcare professionals that serve them. In 2008, the CF Foundation created Quality Care Awards, which are given annually to those care centers demonstrating a sustained commitment to quality improvement that has led to tangible results. Only those 22 care centers that underwent a site visit from their peers on the center committee within the last year are eligible this year. This morning, it's my honor and privilege to publicly recognize several CF care centers in the U.S. for their outstanding work with the 2014 Quality Care Awards. They're listed on this slide. The Children's Hospital in St. Louis, Fletcher Allen Healthcare, University of Vermont, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, Emory University, Riley Hospital for Children, Indiana University, University of Iowa, University of Michigan, Cardinal Glennon, University of Tennessee, and Le Bonheur, and the University of Virginia. Please thank them for their outstanding work with a round of applause. And to all the care center teams across the country and around the world, we really thank you, thank you for all that you do on behalf of people with CF and their families. Next, we'd like to recognize the care centers that have gone above and beyond the call of duty in partnering with their local CF Foundation chapters to support our shared mission. The 2014 Outstanding Partnership Awards go to these centers, Arkansas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine, Central Florida Pulmonary Group, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, Children's Hospital of Oakland, the CF Center of Southern Nevada, Dell Children's Medical Center, Hershey Medical Center in Penn State, Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, Northwestern Memorial Hospital, St. Louis Children's Hospital, and the University of Iowa. Please recognize them with a round of applause. We at the National Office and your partners at the local chapters greatly appreciate all that you do. Next, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Cindy George, Senior Director of Patient Engagement at the CF Foundation. She will describe an important new award and, and announce the first awardees. Thank you very much, Bruce, and good morning, everyone online and here. I am honored to present the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's first Mary M. Contos Care Champion Award. But before I begin, I would like to acknowledge some people who are very important in Mary's life and are here with us today. Her sister Jane O'Donnell, Dr. Drusi Borowitz, and the care team at Women and Children's Hospital of Buffalo. Mary Contos was a nurse clinician, pediatric nurse practitioner, and program coordinator at the Cystic Fibrosis Program at the Women and Children's Hospital of Buffalo. She devoted her life to caring for and advocating for patients in a holistic way and to promoting her center's team cohesion. 
She was deeply committed to the mission of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and played key roles in the Foundation's efforts to advance quality improvement on a locally and national basis and here at this annual conference. She was a mentor and coach to many of us in this room, including myself. Sadly, this inspiring woman died in 2012 at the age of 60. But we remember Mary today with this award in recognition of distinction by a multidisciplinary care team member who displays a passion for excellence, a commitment to care and advocacy for individuals with CF, and a leadership role in the CF community. Of the 20 highly qualified nominees, two were selected to receive this year's award. Our first recipient is described as a tireless patient advocate, a selfless and highly effective mentor, and an outstanding nurse clinician. Her contributions to her center's adult CF program are many, but among the most important have been building an effective multidisciplinary team, organizing and championing quality improvement efforts, and providing highly effective, consistent, and unflappable leadership for her colleagues. Nationally, she serves as a mentor and coach in quality improvement. One colleague wrote, the passion she has for improvements in the lives of individuals with CF translates into an infectious enthusiasm to always advocate her for her patients and overcome whatever obstacles are presented by the health care systems we struggle in. I am proud to announce the first recipient for the Mary M. Contos Award to Connie Richless, Adult CF Nurse Coordinator at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center CF Care Center. Connie, please come up and join me on stage to accept this award. Our second awardee is described as the nucleus and conscious of her CF team. Her tireless efforts on behalf of people with CF and their families have resulted in an environment of collaborative care among patients and families and pediatric and adult care teams. Recognized as an outstanding educator lo locally, regionally, and nationally, she adeptly tailors her teaching to meet individuals' learning styles to ensure an understanding of CF with all people she works with. Her enthusiasm and energy is an inspiration to both the pediatric and adult care team members, motivating everyone to continually strive for excellence in care. A colleague wrote, Mary Contos was her mentor when she started her role as center coordinator. And as a result of this modeling, she has become a true patient advocate, an exceptional care provider, and an outstanding leader in her field. I am proud to announce the second awardee this morning to Lynn Feenan, pediatric nurse coordinator at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. So please join us, Lynn, on stage. Connie and Lynn, all of us thank you for being champions of care for our community. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Cindy, and congratulations to Lynn and Connie. Now to the next generation of investigators who will help us advance the basic and clinical sciences. They will serve as the reinforcements and leaders in the climb up to the summit that Mike Boyle talked about in the first plenary. I know that the selection committee had a difficult job picking from the many high quality abstracts this year. So congratulations and thanks to all of the young investigators. The 2014 Junior Investigator Awards are on the next two slides. The first one for basic science goes to Shyam Ramakandran. I'm sorry, I did my best. I actually practiced that and I had it down perfect, but uh, Shyam, congratulations. And on the next slide, the award for Junior Investigator in the Clinical Research area, a much easier name to pronounce, Catherine Ramsey. Please give them a round of applause and to all the young investigators. Next, we'd like to recognize some people who played key roles in putting this year's conference together. Shown on this slide is the program planning committee. They did a terrific job organizing the program, uh, which is, I think you, you would agree, has proven to be uh, another great conference. Please give them a round of applause. The co-chairs of the committee, Sarah Jane Schwarzenberger and Phil Thomas, are two very special people. They not only did a great job in leading the work of the planning committee, but have also contributed in so many other ways over the years. Sarah Jane and Phil, please come forward to accept a small token of our appreciation for all that you do. Here's Sarah Jane. Sorry, I thought maybe she went home early. I'm the proud owner of two new clocks. <laughs> um. Next, I'd like to recognize our meeting staff. We wouldn't be enjoying this conference without the heavy lifting they did in the weeks and months uh, leading up to the event. Listed on this slide are Cynthia Adams and the meetings group. Please give Cynthia and her amazing team a round of applause for their superb work. Okay, now for the main course. It's, it's truly an honor to introduce this morning's plenary speaker, Dr. Gene Nelson. He's a professor of community and family medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth and the director of the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. He's a national leader in healthcare improvement and in the development and application of measures of quality, system performance, health outcomes, value, and patient perceptions. In the early 90s, Dr. Nelson and his colleagues began developing the clinical microsystem thinking, which has really spread around the world. His work in developing the clinical value compass and whole system measures to assess health system performance has made him a well-recognized quality and measurement expert. He is the recipient of the Joint Commission's prestigious Codman Award for this work. Dr. Nelson has been a pioneer in bringing modern quality improvement thinking into the mainstream of healthcare. He helped launch the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or IHI, and served as a founding board member. 
He's authored over 150 publications and three recent books, Quality by Design, Practice-Based Learning and Improvement, and Value by Design, all of which are on my bookshelf. He received a BA from Dartmouth College, an MPH from Yale, and a Doctorate of Sciences from Harvard. Now you might think that someone with a, an impressive bio like this would be stiff and unapproachable. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Gene is a wonderful person and a great friend to the CF Foundation. As I've gotten to know him over the last 10 years or so, um, I've discovered only one serious personality flaw, and I've never really brought it to public attention un until now. Gene is a diehard Chicago Cubs fan, <laughs> and he will just never, ever give up on his Cubs. Now, as you may be able to see on this slide, the Cubs do win a game every, every now and again. But you have to go back to 1908. 1908 was the last time they won the World Series championship, 1908. Now, I realize that a century is the, is the blink of an eye to many of our European colleagues. But in North America, 1908 is like medieval history. My God, it's before McDonald's, before Disney World, before Starbucks, before the iPhone. Gene, 1908, 1908. I have some ideas that we can talk about. Now, on a more serious note, Gene has generously shared his wisdom and experience with the CF community for over a decade, and he's made major contributions to our quality improvement initiative. He was a central figure in our launching the leadership in learning and leadership collaboratives, in our benchmarking work, in the development of the experience of care survey, and now he's a key leader in an initiative that we've recently launched on what the CF care model of the future might look like. The title of his presentation is From Codman to Collaboratories, a care model for CF that's fit for the future. Please welcome Gene to the podium. Forever, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much, Bruce. That was the uh, best intro ever. It's a great uh, privilege to be with you here this morning, and I'd like to uh, recognize you for being here on a Saturday morning, a beautiful day, uh, live and in person, as well as the video audience uh, that is uh, with live streaming. So the talk uh, title is uh, From Codman to Collaboratories, a Care Model Fit for the Future. And um, I, I'm very uh, passionate uh, about this topic, and I, I think you'll get a sense uh, why as we proceed. Uh, the, the flow of the talk uh, really starts with two people. Uh, it's Colleen's and Sonia's story. And then a uh, rapid review of the evolution of registries uh, in the United States and then introducing a new care model that we think could make a wonderful difference in the CF community, followed by a, a message about how value for patients and families in the community is really created, uh, fairly simple, just three ways, and then the wrap up, the opportunity for the CF community. So uh, this is Colleen. Uh, Colleen O'Connor, born in 1968, and I got to know Colleen because of uh, the fellow on uh, the lower right, Jerry O'Connor. Uh, Colleen was 12 when I met her. I was at Dartmouth, a new assistant professor. We were starting something we called the Primary Care Cooperative Information Project with this uh, crazy idea that we might be able to uh, both study care in real primary care practices, as well as to improve care in those practices. Uh, Jerry O'Connor at that time was uh, a single parent. He had two children, Colleen and Nancy, and um, uh, he loved to trout fish. You can see him getting ready to take Colleen on a fishing, uh, fishing expedition in Vermont. Um, 
Despite uh, Jerry's best efforts and her family's best efforts, uh, Colleen uh, died at age 23, and she, of course, died of CF. Um, here is Sonia. Sonia lives in Stockholm. Sonia was born in 2002. I've gotten to know Sonia because of her father, Andreas Hager. Uh, Sonia was also born with CF. Uh, Andreas, like Jerry, has uh, become very active in trying to make Sonia's tomorrows as long and good as possible. Uh, Andreas is a, a lawyer, an entrepreneur, and uh, he's become a, a patient advocate, uh, very uh, uh, passionate and very effective. And you'll hear a little bit more about uh, Sonia uh, in uh, a bit later in the talk and what we hope her prospects for a long and enjoyable life might be. We have indeed something to celebrate. I was told that uh, about 10 years ago that this group uh, might have been 400 people strong, not 4,000. And in just that 10-year period, uh, the length of life has increased by about a decade. It's amazing. In the last 10 years, people are living 10 years longer uh, in North America on average. Uh, the special issue of the BMJ Quality and Safety Journal that is um, really only made possible by your work and the work of the uh, leadership in the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, uh, Bob Beal, Preston, Bruce, Kathy, others. Um, your work has made it possible for those yellow bars represent gains in life expectancy. It's an amazing story. There is much to celebrate. And yet, we all know that for Sonia, the clock is ticking. We have to even do even better in making improvements tomorrow than we have uh, with the stellar example of improvements in the past 50 years and especially the past decade. So there's a challenge um, that we all face for the Sonias and Jacks and others uh, in our lives and our families in the community. Uh, it is a bit of a moonshot, uh, but uh, this picture uh, shows that Moonshots, extraordinary accomplishments, uh, can be made in relatively short periods of time. And uh, we have a challenge in front of us, uh, and it is to go even further in accelerating uh, best outcomes for each and every person living with CF. So imagine that children born with CF in Atlanta or Peoria, that's a Cubs town, or Tallahassee, or Seattle, or Winnipeg, expecting to live just as long as anyone else. That's the challenge, that's the moonshot, expecting to live just as long as anyone else. Uh, I learned uh, just this morning that uh, in Canada, the life expectancy is now over 50 years best in the world, most likely. Amazing. Can it be 70? Amazing. So uh, we have a big challenge in front of us. Uh, we are fortunate that we have great work to build on. And um, we will get a quick review of some of this great work to build on in this second part of this presentation. So here's uh, the Gene Nelson official, unofficial, Registry Hall of Fame. Codman, O'Connor, Lynn Blad, and Margolis. Oh, that looks like Babe Ruth. Wait a second. Okay. Margolis. So we have Codman, Ernest Codman, Harvard trained surgeon, started the and results system, around 1910. Jerry O'Connor, batting second. 
started the Northern New England Cardiovascular Group and worked with the CF Foundation for the CF Registry to make it uh, extraordinary. And uh, then we have Stefan Lindblad, uh, Karolinska Institute, the Swedish Rheumatology Quality Registry, and um, finally, uh, batting cleanup, we have Peter Margolis, the Improved Care Now Network, now uh, moving into something called Chronic Care Collaborative Network, C3N. So a little bit about each of these. Ernest Amory Codman, he was a bit of a renegade. And uh, in about uh, 1910, he had been trained as a surgeon at Harvard. He was practicing at Mass General Hospital. He was a bit of a uh, young Turk of a surgeon. He had this crazy idea that the uh, professors of surgery should be uh, honored not based on their longevity, but based on their outcomes. And he developed this idea, what he called the end results idea. Uh, I'll read it. It's that every hospital should trace each patient with the object of ascertaining whether maximum benefit has been obtained and to find out if not, why not. The end results idea merely demands, merely demands that the results shall be constantly analyzed and possible methods of improvement constantly considered. This was 1910. He did not make himself popular at Mass General Hospital. And he was uh, pushing and pushing, and he saw that he was going to be fired. So uh, instead of letting himself be fired, he actually volunteered to become chair of surgery. And when they declined him being named chair of surgery at age 28, he quit before he was fired. He did not go quietly. He um, got together uh, the mayor of Boston and many dignitaries, and he held public hearings on what he viewed as the failures of Mass General Hospital. And if you could study uh, this uh, classical poster, you would see in the middle of the poster there's a goose laying golden eggs, and that represents the rich people in the, uh, in the Beacon Hill community and in Boston, providing massive amounts of money to Mass General Hospital. And on the right-hand side, um, over here, uh, there is the Board of Clinical Truth. And the Board of Clinical Truth is saying, if we let her know, and the Board of Clinical Truth is saying, if we let the people of the back bay that are laying the golden eggs, if we let the truth about our patients out, do you suppose she would still be willing to lay? This, um, this amazing person, Codman, um, did, as I indicate, indicated, uh, leave Mass General. And for seven years, he ran the End Results Hospital, a 15-bed unit. Uh, on Beacon Hill. Amongst his colleagues was a Dr. Cushing, who later became uh, perhaps the most influential uh, physician in the United States and helped to start this End Results Hospital. By 1917-1918, uh, Dr. Codman, Ernest Amory Codman, had sort of run out of energy and um, people forgot about him. But not everybody forgot about him. Jerry O'Connor knew about Codman. And it's due to the work of Jerry and his colleagues that literally thousands of people today are alive and well in northern New England after undergoing open heart surgery, cabbage surgery, because of the work of the study group. And the study group was based on Codman's principles. Every person undergoing open heart surgery in the 10 places that do this in this little corner of the world, northern New England, uh, the data is recorded on the process and on the outcomes. It's made transparent. It's used for improvement. And um, the story uh, of the NNE actually starts in 1988 
when uh, the federal government, it was called HICFA then, released mortality statistics on every hospital in the United States, 1988, every hospital's mortality rates were made public. And uh, Jerry O'Connor was a young professor at Dartmouth at this time, and uh, Stephen Plume was the head of cardiovascular surgery, and the federal government told Dartmouth that they had among the worst rates in the country, and certainly the worst mortality rates in northern New England. Well, how could a great place like Dartmouth, with people like Jerry O'Connor, epidemiologist, Stephen Plume, world-famous surgeon, how could we possibly have the worst mortality rates? So uh, they went together uh, to form the study group of the 10 hospitals in northern New England, and they collected data on every case, uh, the surgery, the length of life following surgery, and uh, for up to just one year. They did the best case mix adjustment known to man or woman, and in three years, from 1988 to 1991, they proved that HICFA was right. Dartmouth did actually have the worst mortality rates in northern New England, and that hurt. So uh, rather than um, throw up their hands and say, now what do we do? They said, um, let's improve our performance. Let's uh, use what uh, Paul Batalden, Don Berwick, uh, Deming, and others, Codman, have said uh, to make our practices better. And so the story uh, unfolds and the region went uh, to the top of the best mortality rates as an entire region. Hundreds of publications have come out of the study group. And uh, by 2000, it was a success um, and widely known. And it was about that time that uh, Jerry, having learned the lessons uh, of really making changes in outcomes, in this case, mortality rate for open heart surgery, that he approached um, Bob Bell and uh, Bruce Marshall and others uh, and said, what if the CF Foundation were to do something like this? There's more to the story than that, but essentially um, the uh, registry as part of the CF Foundation was um, invigorated uh, by uh, Jerry and uh, built upon this amazing success story. So now, in 2014, we have the BMJ Quality and Safety Journal featuring your work. So the third member of the Registry's Hall of Fame go to Sweden. Uh, this is uh, Stefan Lindblad, MD, PhD, a rheumatologist. Literally, in Sweden, rheumatoid arthritis remission rates have been plummeting, uh, do we believe, to the work of the Swedish Rheumatology Quality Registry. Um, the backstory on the Swedish Rheumatology Quality Registry was that it actually started in 1996. Guess who had visited Sweden in the mid-90s and was talking about the power of registries for improvement, not just for research? It was our friend Jerry O'Connor. Um, Stefan said, well, we could do this. We could start a rheumatology registry. Um, he did, they did. It was modeled uh, in large measure on the NNE. And then uh, about five years later, uh, Stefan was visiting me at Dartmouth. And uh, he was a nice guy, and uh, he had great ideas, and he was telling me about this great registry that they had started, and uh, his hopes for the future, and what a difference this could make to outcomes and to, uh, for regular people with rheumatology problems and for uh, the science uh, to, to support that, to make care better. And I said, well, geez, that's a wonderful um, vision that you have, Stefan, and I, I'm quite sure you'll be successful, but let me show you what, uh, what just opened at, at Dartmouth. It's this really interesting program. It was called the Dartmouth Spine Center. 
And um, the Dartmouth Spine Center was started by Jim Weinstein. Then he was uh, just a, a professor of, of uh, surgery, of orthopedics. He wasn't uh, the head of orthopedics, he was just a surgeon. But he had the, um, the blessing of the leadership of Dartmouth Hitchcock to start a spine center. And his idea was pretty simple. What if, rather than people with spine problems and neck problems wandering all over the system to see an internist or an orthopod or go to the pain clinic or go to PT, what if we brought all those mental health, what if we brought all those people together into one place, social workers? So it was one-stop shopping. 1998, the doors opened after two years of planning. But it wasn't just modern, really good interdisciplinary care. A new information environment was created. And that new information environment was based on a principle called feed-forward data, which means uh, in common terms that you feed, the for data, you feed forward the data to the place in care delivery so that you have the information you need at the point of care so that it can be used in, in healthcare to benefit the patient. Feed forward patient reported outcomes data, patient reported data, feed forward clinical data, so we always know just how that person is doing when we're seeing that person, as well as the treatments that they have had and the disease or diseases uh, that they have. Uh, so Stefan visited the Spine Center. He spent a half a day there with uh, Jim Weinstein and Bill Abdu and, and others. And um, the next morning, he showed up in my office. And I said, so what did you think of the Spine Center, Stefan? He said, that was amazing. I think we could do this in Sweden. And, um, and he did. So that the Swedish Rheumatology Quality Registry uh, combines literally the best of, uh, of an NNE or a CFF style registry, but brings into it this idea of feeding forward the patient reported data and the clinical data to create a new information environment. So uh, this is a, uh, a woman with rheumatoid arthritis in Sweden uh, entering her, um, her data on her joint counts and on her quality of life before seeing her uh, clinician. And this uh, information from the patient and from the clinical data is automatically creating a dashboard. This dashboard, of course, is in Swedish. Your Swedish is probably better than mine, but. Um, what this dashboard does is that every column is a visit date. And this particular person had uh, one, two, three, four, five, six visits in the year 2010. Uh, the first three visits, January to March, are lit up in red. And that's because um, the person's disease activity score based on patient reported symptoms and health related quality of life and based on blood test results showed that this person uh, was not in remission. Uh, and then it goes to green. So from June, September, December, it goes to green. This person has an excellent quality of life. Her EQ5D score, that's a, a health related quality of life score, is top box, it's excellent. What happened? There was an N of 1 experiment. The N of 1 experiment showed this person responding to a biologic drug that worked for her. This dashboard is the fuel for a new way of collecting registry data and using that registry data for clinical decision support when the patient's being seen. And now, uh, today, it's also available to the person at home so that they can pull down their dashboard at any time of the night or day for self-management purposes. There's a wonderful video that I will not show that explains this. It brings this Swedish Rheumatology Quality Registry to light and to life. And you would see Karen, a patient, 
using her dashboard for self-management when times are tough and recognizing she can and will get better and her uh, specialist physician talking about how this dashboard helps her provide better care to her patient and feeds into a registry for retrospective and prospective research. So um, I mentioned that, uh, a few moments ago that literally patients' outcomes are better across all of Sweden. Here you have uh, the red line that uh, shows the trend uh, from 2002 to 2012 for all of Sweden. Uh, the registry now covers 70 different diagnoses. This is rheumatoid arthritis only. And the remission rate has gone from 10% uh, not in remission, terrible situation, to 5% not in remission over this 10-year period of time. The blue line, the blue line represents one practice, the Gavle Rheumatology Center. And um, about four years ago, Sven Tegmark, who I uh, was privileged to meet recently, became the head of rheumatology for a county. And it occurred to him that he might actually use this registry data in the way that I just described, actually use it actively with the patients, get the patients to use it actively, so that the patients, when their self-management breaks down, or if it breaks down, they come in right away. They get followed very tightly. If they're doing well, it's, it's, it's very open. You can come in when you need to. You can see the nurse specialist. You can see the rheumatologist. It's up to you. And, uh, and then they've got the comparative, transparent data on how their center is doing compared to others. And you can see this blue line in Gavle went from being extraordinarily high non-remission rates, uh, over 40% at one point uh, in 2003, uh, to being much more stable and as good or better than the rest of Sweden when they took advantage of this registry-enabled care and learning and improvement system. So the last chapter in the uh, registry evolution story uh, is from the United States. I only learned about this uh, recently uh, due to a special project uh, doing work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And um, we were looking at the registry and long-term collaborative scene in the United States and um, we knew about the great work that you all had done. We didn't know about the great work that uh, Improved Care Now has done um, for children with inflammatory bowel disease across the United States. It started in 2007. Uh, the, the hub was Cincinnati Children's, not the hub, the organizer was Cincinnati Children's uh, Pediatric IBD. It started with 30, approximately 30 centers across the country, has now spread to about 70 centers across the country. And uh, this long-term collaborative has been associated with remission rates improving for this very, uh, very difficult problem from 55% in 2007 to 79% today. And today, a third of the 70 centers have remission rates well above 80%, and 60% of the patients in remission are achieving that without steroids. Those, are, those results were unimaginable five years ago. So very rapid uh, improvement in this very uh, special population. What, uh, why I'm bringing this up uh, is the way they went about it was a bit different, and it was a co-design of the innovation of this collaborative by, guess what? The co-design from the beginning at the table before there was an Improved Care Now network, it started with patients and families, teenagers with the disease and their families, and representatives, people from clinical care teams, interdisciplinary care teams, and scientists sitting down together and saying, how good could we make the care outcomes for people with inflammatory bowel disease? 
And uh, it started with a, a fundamental approach of we will design this, we'll run it, we'll implement it, we'll improve it based on co-design by three groups, patients and families, care teams, and the scientific community. The results have been, as I mentioned, very, very good. This is 2009 to 2014. Uh, as mentioned, the starting rate was 55% in remission, now 79%, and, um, uh, and those rates uh, are gradually inching up, uh, getting better and better. So, those are the first two parts of, of, of the story. Um, Colleen O'Connor, Sonia Hager, and the evolution of registries and long-term collaboratives um, in North America and in Europe. So we're, uh, we're into it, and now we're going to get in deeper. Uh, before uh, talking more about this idea about collaboratories, funny word, and co-production, another funny word, um, we're going to ask um, uh, Jack Sabadosa and Kathy Sabadosa to tell you a little bit about this emerging model that might be fit for the future. And we'll play a video with Jack and Kathy and Lynn. Hi, my name is Jack. I'm 14 years old and I have cystic fibrosis. I really love basketball. It's one of my passions. I'm a big uh, cross-country runner. I do cross-country skiing in the winter and in the spring I'm a big track athlete. Having CF takes up a lot of my time. Some of my treatments include I do the vest 40 minutes a day. While I do the vest, I inhale both hypertonic saline and pomazine and whenever I eat, I have to take enzymes. So really treatment takes up probably an hour out of my day. I'm Kathy Sabadosa, I'm the QI project manager for the CF Foundation, and I'm Jack's mom. CF is a constant in our lives. We have to remember to have his medications on hand. His annual visit can take up to anywhere from two to three hours just to get all the screening done and all the tests done that he needs. There's a lot of time in tracking things down to get culture results or to get um, prescript new prescriptions filled. It can be um, a bit challenging at times to make sure we have all the information we need to take good care of Jack. So I've been working with the CF Foundation um, and the CF community for over 10 years and it's been really exciting to be part of it. We have a really strong network, very dedicated providers. We spend a lot of time working together to improve care really at the front line and the ground level. But I still think we have more to do. I think we can push our model even further. Um, with the right technologies and the right tools in place so that it's seamless. We shouldn't have to get information from different places and different parts of the system to be able to take good care of somebody with CF. The new care model that the CF Foundation is launching um, into is really about sharpening the point of care, really trying to build a model that facilitates where the physician or care provider meets the person with CF at the point of care. We see this as a whole new opportunity for people like Jack who are busy. He is able to manage a lot of his other aspects of his life online, his schoolwork, his homework. Why can't he manage his CF care online? He should be able to talk to his providers in between appointments if he needs to. In addition to really helping people with CF, we hope that the new care model will also help healthcare providers um, in CF clinical care. I work with many care teams um, through quality improvement work that I do for the CF Foundation and I hear them. It is a lot of time to make phone calls for pre-authorization, to enter data into electronic medical records, and to then in enter data into the patient registry. My name is Lynn Feenan and I'm a clinical nurse specialist at the New Hampshire CF Center and the nurse coordinator for the center. Any time something can be made more efficient and more seamless, uh, and we can get information out to patients and back to our own registry database for our outcomes, that will be a great system. And it will save a lot of time, and time that I can then spend taking care of patients instead of 
playing around with papers and moving data back and forth. Data scattered across the healthcare system right now, we need to bring all of that together to alleviate the burden of care for people with CF and their care teams. That's a world premiere. Thank you. So this idea of collaboratories, I, I was reading uh, in 2007 Ben Schneiderman's article in Science, and he used the term collaboratory. Uh, what he was talking about was a new way of doing science and improving care. He was uh, featuring the Human Genome Project as an example of a collaboratory where laboratories from around the world were collaborating actively day in day out to make a huge breakthrough mapping the human genome and he said traditional scientific methods need to be expanded to deal with complex issues that arise as social systems meet technological innovation I really uh, was quite uh, uh, taken by this very brief article in 2007 and uh, now we're moving to uh, October 16th uh, of last year, 2013. And uh, a group from Karolinska and from Dartmouth and from the foundation and some regular patients and some regular providers were trying to envision a, a care model and an improvement model and a model for making science that would take advantage of the evolution in registries and collaboratives I mentioned earlier. And uh, what we started to discover was that uh, really there is the world of the person living with CF, Kathy, Jack, the family, it's a social system. There are the frontline care teams, Lynn, uh, Worth Parker, interdisciplinary care teams. And those are, are social systems. Uh, that um, come together to benefit individuals, best optimal health outcomes for individuals living with CF, and hopefully uh, lowest total real cost for the community, best value care. Uh, but that there were um, IT technology capabilities that could be brought to bear uh, to make registries and patient networks actually work much better. And uh, this is the first draft of the model, a little bit hard to uh, see. At the top it's labeled patient-centered decision support, patient-centered decision support for the co-production of good care and better health and more health confidence. Well, uh, this started, we thought, to be a good idea, a big idea. And uh, Paul Batalden, a friend and colleague, uh, said this uh, not long ago, all services at some level are co-produced. Uh, services are co-produced. So it's Jack uh, working with Lynn and others to co-produce the care. You saw him doing that at home. And that leads to the health outcomes. So this idea of co-production of care and possibly of science is a very uh, powerful idea. So I'll go through this rather quickly, uh, but what uh, we did between October of last year and um, April, uh, May of, of this year, was to refine this model. And uh, this is the way it starts to look. It starts uh, with patients or people living with a condition on the one hand, on the uh, left side, and um, people uh, caring for those patients, the provider interdisciplinary care team on the right side, and they come together from time to time, maybe four times a year. Uh, hopefully, with feed-forward patient-reported data and with feed-forward clinical data to see how that person is doing right now, what they've been doing in the recent past, and therefore, what they should be doing next for optimal health and for high value care. Um, what this creates 
uh, is a learning health system for more effective action by patients, providers, researchers. And this is where uh, the information technology environment comes in that you actually uh, can see in Sweden an integration of the patient reported and clinical data uh, with the electronic health records. Uh, it's seamless to the care team. There's also an integration with the personal health records if the person wishes to do that. And uh, the data that is used fundamentally for good care for this individual feeds into the collaborative network. It is fed by a registry system, an advanced registry system. And the new kid on the block, in many respects, is this, uh, what some people call a facilitated network. Uh, a faci facilitated network uh, is, for example, Wikipedia. Um, it's a curated, facilitated network to make what we know available to anybody with a computer to use it. It's a facilitated, curated network. What does this look like in healthcare? That's what we're starting to discover. And if we take a curated, patient-centered, facilitated network uh, with e-health capabilities, we start to have whole new abilities to help a person and a family take care of themselves. So that's uh, the overview of the model. And um, uh, a key mechanism in this model is uh, that it integrates the feed-forward uh, information from the patient and the clinician for better care for an individual person, for practice-based improvement based on comparative benchmarking and shared learning, and a research platform for retrospective and prospective research. Um, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is, is very interested in seeing if this model can't be fit for its future. And, uh, you know, the future is actually here, uh, someone said. It's just not well distributed. You can see features of this conceptual model already out there being used. This is Sonia again. On her lap is her feed-forward data that she has just taken to her visit to her CF center in Stockholm. And she's briefing her mother on the way home about how the visit went to the care center. And not all of her visits are, are actually that great in her view. But she said, this was a great visit. It was awesome. Uh, this is um, what she went into her visit with. She started with her agenda of the topic she would wish to have covered. They developed uh, the clinometrics, the clinical status together. She had pre-recorded, fed forward her functional status, physical health, mental health, how she gets along in school with the kids, etc., and her concerns. She had two big concerns. Uh, and then the notes and agreed upon actions are the upper right. And she was thrilled because this visit met her concerns and they had a plan to deal with it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Andreas is an entrepreneur. He's working with the uh, Stockholm CF Center uh, and their registry to start to bring uh, this uh, sophisticated patient feed-forward data like you saw in the SRQ to bear with CF. Okay, so uh, this model uh, is emerging. It could be uh, captured and made uh, into its own by the CF community. There is this opportunity. And to make uh, the next issue of the BMJ quality and safety uh, even more spectacular. Um, this issue of value, really only three ways to make value for the end user. That's the person living with the condition, the family, and it's a solution shop or a value chain or a facilitated network. And uh, solution shops, think Sherlock Holmes. Think Mayo Clinic. Uh, lower right, Mayo Clinic, got tumor? Where do you go if you're in trouble? Uh, what if the CF centers became solution shops for people with increasingly complex comorbidities and living with CF, enabled by what's known throughout the world to bring to bear to this individual? 
value chains. Think Toyota production system. Think Lean Six Sigma. Uh, think about the Aravind Eye Care Institute, the eye care system in India. Um, they're producing amazing outcomes at literally a fraction of the cost that we uh, incur in the United States. It's, it's uh, when things are repeatable and replicable, you can create the value chain and do the right thing in the right way in the right time safely every time. Very important way of delivering value. So in CF care, things that are truly routine, like um, uh, periodic assessments uh, and a core treatment plan that uses the evidence base might be a value chain aspect. But uh, uh, much of the power will be, Clay Christensen is the very eminent uh, professor at the Harvard Business School uh, on innovation. He wrote a book um, on healthcare recently. And uh, what he was saying was that this idea of facilitated networks will be the disruptive innovation, innovative force in healthcare. I uh, think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Wikipedia. When I was growing up, it was Encyclopedia Britannica, it was World Book, etc. They're gone. That's disruptive innovation. They are no longer in business. Where do we go now for encyclopedic knowledge? Wikipedia, anybody can edit Wikipedia. It is curated. Um, cystic Life is an example, perhaps, of an emerging facilitated network. Patients like me um, uh, building a self-learning healthcare system, according to Paul Wicks. A thousand CF patients are uh, active in patients like me, uh, 7,000 active in cystic life. The future is here, it's just not well distributed, it's certainly not connected and integrated. So. Uh, as we think about delivering value uh, for people living with CF longer and better, um, a basic conceptual model that we could tailor and make proven a reality on the ground in the CF community. It could include shops, chains, networks. Um, and uh, this new care model of the future in in my view, uh, would be fueled by what you might think of as a registry-enabled care and learning system with great information uh, being fed forward and being used and reused. Um, by the way, oh, by the way, our, our friend Brent James always says, oh, by the way, when he wants to make an important point. The way we pay for healthcare in the U.S. is changing from being volume-based to value-based. It's reaching a tipping point. And uh, there's a, it used to be the further you got into the healthcare system, the more Dartmouth-Hitchcock made. The money was in the illness. The payment model is shifting so that actually the healthier the person is and the more that they take care of themselves well at home and get care as needed, so the, the more healthy the person is, the more money Dartmouth-Hitchcock makes. We're turning over all of our contracts as rapidly as possible to be per capita value-based. This will change the environment for the CF care model of the future and uh, in a way that does favor best outcomes. Lowest production costs, and that's why I wanted to mention the only way to create value is to use chains properly, to use solution shops properly, to make new use of facilitated curated networks properly, and you could be in the position that you wish to be in. So, wrapping up the opportunity for the CF community. Imagine a new CF care model supported by a collaboratory for co-production of care, innovation, improvement, and science. Imagine a continuously improving system for co-created and co-produced care. Imagine a CF care model that's fit for the future. Imagine in a few years that people and families living with CF are confident and competent in self-management and can contact similar people and health experts any time of the night or day. That CF care teams are in contact with and can respond to patients and families whenever needed 
to rapidly adjust treatments to achieve better outcomes, and can rapidly adopt new best practices, even faster than you can today. Uh, imagine that we have scientific laboratories in CF that use data from CF patients and clinicians to discover and spread information on what treatments work best for what kinds of patients under what conditions. And imagine that the CF Foundation and medical specialty societies make learning and improvement based on relevant data part of everyday practice and continuous professional development and transparent performance reporting. So imagine children born with CF in Atlanta or Peoria or Tallahassee or Seattle or Winnipeg expecting to live just as long as anyone else. Thank you. <laughs>